Jesse Volume 4 was released on February 29th of 2024, the final chapter in the multi-album series Jesse from Jacob Collier. And it seems like every possible opinion about this album is held by someone somewhere. Some people love it, some people hate it, some say it's doing too much, some say it's not doing enough, and for any ordering of the tracks you could come up with, someone probably ranks them that way. For me and many old fans of Jacob, the album was disappointing, and I think there's a lot to unpack there, so sit tight, uh, or dance around, or whatever, but we're gonna do context and nuance and all that good stuff to figure out what the hell went wrong with Jesse Volume 4. So I became a fan of Jacob around late 2017 like October, November 2017, something like that. Among the current set of people who you could consider fans by whatever metric, I was probably in the first 10%, roughly. Maybe it's five, maybe it's 15, but that's the ballpark, right? So I was a fan before Jesse, uh, but I was not there to witness the release of In My Room. Uh, I missed that by a little bit, by like a, a year and a half, I guess. Maybe that's not a little bit. I wasn't there for In My Room, but I was there for In My Room. Um, I became a fan because of the In My Room era stuff, the stuff that came immediately after and immediately before In My Room. For better context on Jacob Collier himself, he started out on YouTube making these split screen covers of old tunes and also a Robert Frost poem and also Flintstones. I don't know. He made these cool arrangements. I mean, the, the very beginning of his YouTube channel, like that stuff was like, <laughs> But you know, uh, by like I saw three ships, shit was getting good. And this caught the attention of one Quincy Jones, the producer of the best-selling album of all time, no less. And basically, Quincy Jones reached out to Jacob Collier, and he was like, "Hey, uh, let me manage you." And Jacob Collier was like, "No." Uh, not yet. I want to go make an album all by myself, and then we can strike a deal later. So that's what he did. He made In My Room, and In My Room kind of marks this era. In My Room, for me, is like the best album of all time. It's not even close. It's like In My Room, and then Tied for Second are like eight different other albums, uh, including some other albums from Jacob. But In My Room was this album that he made in roughly three months, all by himself in his room. And it is this creative explosion uh, that was incredibly satisfying and mind-blowing. It was like seeing a new color uh, when I discovered it. Someone commented that on a YouTube video one time, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly what it was like. It was like seeing a new color. At that time, um, and, and I think even more so, the farther back you go, the more this was true, Jacob Collier was very much a musician's musician. I think he still is that to some extent today, but much less than at that time. But especially among young jazz musicians, Jacob Collier was really big and really important. And I was one such young jazz musician. I remember when I went to college, especially, and I was playing with other people who were really serious and really into their music and into jazz and into funk and into arranging and writing and music theory and all this stuff. Um, there were just tons of people around me who also shared this uh, appreciation for Jacob Collier. Because Jacob Collier, not only was he, you know, incredibly skilled at all this stuff, he played every instrument and he played them all amazingly and he had this command of rhythm and harmony that seemed unnatural. He also was very open about all the stuff that he did. Like, he talked about the music theory that his stuff demanded. After In My Room, he does a few things here and there. Most notably, I think, he released In the Bleak Midwinter. That arrangement really kind of broke the sky open in some ways for, like, harmony theory. What he did in that song is he, he did something called microtonal modulation, and, and this became a uh, real hot topic among nerdy music theory lovers like myself. And he talked with this guy called Jun Lee. Uh, he did a series of interviews with Jun Lee over time uh, around that era, uh, where he talked about these really interesting, catchy music theory concepts that he was using in his music, like Super Ultra Hyper Mega Metalidian, Microtonal Modulation, and negative harmony, and these kind of things. Now, I have made videos about all of these concepts since then, so this was very influential on me. Like, my most viewed video 
is about super ultra hyper mega metal idiot well, my most viewed youtube video and this i think was really important like jacob collier wasn't just an amazing musician who was making music that made you feel like you were seeing a new color but he was also very open about all of it he also did a lot of live streams where he would just make stuff live not hiding anything it seemed like magic a lot of the time when he would do stuff when he would come up with a chord progression and it's like where the hell did that come from but he was just doing it there live nothing was hidden and that was so captivating and engaging and i, I really do think it it added to my love for his music step two after in my room not this remember step one necessarily but um I'm going to do a bunch of collaboration with people, like orchestra and big band and artists and stuff for this next project, I think. So he announces Jesse in 2018, it's supposed to be four albums. The first album is supposed to be big and wide and orchestral in the morning. The second album is supposed to be the afternoon. It's supposed to be cozy, lots of plucked strings and beautiful things. And then volume three is supposed to be the nighttime, weird, electronic, funk, negative space kind of space. And then volume four, a uh, question mark, but really, he said, volume four is gonna be a combination of all those three different worlds. So volumes one and two were great. Uh, volume one came out, I remember the first single, With the Love in My Heart, I remember when that came out, and my first reaction to it was something like, wow, has Jacob actually gone too far? Uh, but the more I listened to it, the more I came to love it, and um, it's one of my favorite tracks from him just in general now it's it's a crazy ride and there's a lot going on uh, but especially i think after you've listened to it five or ten times it's really really good and i think for me at least jacob collier's music has always kind of had this pattern where um it gets better after several listens like it, it grows on me in a way that music has never really done with any other artist like usually with other artists it's just like the first time i hear it is the best or maybe the second time i hear it is the best but with jacob very often it's like the fifth or the tenth time is the best listen of that song uh, and then it, you know, kind of maybe slowly tapers after that. But with the love in my heart, that was the first single from volume one. And I, I remember when that came out and I was like, oh my goodness, we're, we're really doing this. Now, of course, volumes one and two did not come out quite on the initial schedule that he had proposed. He was a little bit too ambitious. They were actually eight months apart. So at that, at that rate, you're going to get like three years for the four albums. And with all of this came a lot of discussion. Uh, not that there hadn't been discussion before, but I mean, he was gaining traction. He was putting out more stuff. He was getting more popular, um, especially among musicians. You know, by like 2019, it was kind of like every musician knows Jacob Collier and a lot of them really love him, especially if you were on the younger side or on the jazz side of things. I think that because Jacob was so open about music theory, he kind of got this label of being the music theory guy. This ends up having a weird kind of effect, like linguistically, because people who weren't as familiar with him would think that that means that he's the guy who like knows the rules really well and follows the rules really well, because there is this kind of common misunderstanding of music theory meaning like rules to follow um where you say like oh there are, there are no parallel fits like that's like music theory right <laughs> if you have that conception of what music theory means and then there's this guy who's the music theory guy and then you listen to his music and it doesn't resonate with you you're going to kind of think that basically what he did was he followed a bunch of rules but he didn't have any soul and that's why you didn't like it in reality Jacob Collier was all about breaking existing music theory. He was all about making stuff that demanded new music theory. He was very much the opposite of like following the rules. And I was jamming away. You know, and I got the dirtiest looks in my life from the, um, from the, you know, from the other people in the, in the orchestra and the, and the leader of the department. It was just like, bro, there are some things you just don't do and jamming along in pizzicato style to a great piece of classical music is one of them. And uh, I didn't learn my lesson. I, I maintained my jamming, but I did it even quieter and even more like deliberately. Now I musically misbehave for a living. So basically by the time that volume two had come out, I would say this was the case even years before that, but certainly by the time that volume two came out, uh, Jacob Collier had kind of established himself as a provider of, I would say, three big things. Unbridled 
rhythm, and harmony, pushing the envelope, demanding new theory to explain what the hell was going on. Prodigial musicianship, it seemed kind of effortless for him to play whatever he wanted at any point in time. And finally, this might include the first one actually, but intentional maximalism. Jacob Collier is a self-described maximalist. There's a quote from, uh, oh, what? How do I put this? An audience Q&A after a screening of a documentary about some performance that Jacob did with MIT students, where he says, Less is only more when you know what more is. I say intentional maximalism because while Jacob was maximalist, I think he's actually said it this way before, it's maximalism for the sake of minimalism in some, in some sense, something like that, where basically the point was, I want to get across a feeling and I'm going to do everything in my power to do that. Sometimes that actually means a very stripped down arrangement. If you listen to a track like In the Real Early Morning, that track is not like crazy dense or anything. And there's actually a lot of silence, a lot of very sparse instrumentation throughout that. And that was the thing, is that he was perfectly capable of making stripped down arrangements, uh, but he just wanted to explore the full gamut and go crazy sometimes and have a thousand tracks. So altogether, this was just gold for music nerds, right? Jacob Collier was... He was kind of everything I wanted to be. I think I still, to this day, kind of want to be Jacob Collier. Um, and I feel like, you know, I wouldn't make volume four like that, but, um, and I wouldn't make volume three like that either. I wouldn't make anything like that actually. Uh, but I want to be Jacob Collier in so many ways. And, and I, I would say that, especially, you know, when I was 17, 18, I've kind of been disappointed by him recently. And so maybe there's a bit of a bitter taste in my mouth now, but, you know, I have to admit to myself, I still, I still kind of want to be Jacob Collier. So, volume three. Jacob had originally said that volume three was going to be this like crazy electronic, funky weirdness, negative space, it's the nighttime now kind of thing. And he put out these things called beat sketches. And these were, I guess, like the name implies, they were kind of sketches for volume three. They were explicitly tied to volume three. So he was using like volume three artwork language for them. Uh, however, he was not publishing them like as singles or even snippets from volume three. It was more just like, these are kind of the spaces that I'm thinking about here. And the beat sketches were, were really cool. I really like them. And they're just these crazy sounds, fully swimming around you, all sorts of weird sounds and things. And that very much fit the crazy, weird, funk, electronic stuff that he was saying volume three was going to be. When the singles started coming out though, um, it was a bit of a different story. Uh, like it was steering much more into the R&B direction. So when volume three actually did come out, it was indeed more along the R&B and, and pop lines. Uh, in fact, All I Need, which was kind of the marquee single of the album that Jacob did like seven different, I'm not even exaggerating, I think he literally did seven different versions of this. All I Need, I think, got nominated for best R&B performance, like in the Grammys. And Jesse Volume 3 actually got nominated for Album of the Year, which was really weird. You know, it's a good album, it's got a lot of good stuff going on it, but for most of us, us meaning fans of Jacob from before Jesse, for most of us, it was a step down. Before Jesse Volume 3, every single time that Jacob made a new song, every single song that he released, I remember the feeling of listening to a Jacob Collier song for the first time. It was so special. And with Volume 3, that started to fade a little bit. None of the tracks on that album are bad by any means. In fact, they're all really good. Just some of them didn't rise to the immense heights that everything before it had. Controversial take here, potentially. I think Volume 3 is actually the poppiest of Jacob's records. Volume 4 is usually framed that way as like, this is Jacob trying to do pop. It's not really for lack of trying on the part of Volume 4, it's more for lack of succeeding. I mean, it's not like he didn't collaborate with huge artists on Volume 3. He collaborated with Daniel Caesar and T-Pain and Ty Dolla Sign on Volume 3. Like, those are huge, huge guys, just as big as any of the pop stars on Volume 4, uh, but there weren't as many categorical pop stars on Volume 3 
So I can kind of see that, but also there weren't as many tracks overall. So, eh. If he had just said it was gonna be like an R&B centric record to begin with, and then we had got, like gotten butterflies and lighted up on me as a surprise on top of that, I really feel like that would have shifted perspectives a lot. And I still, you know, wouldn't have rated it higher than Jesse Volume 1 and 2, but uh, might not have been as disappointed by it. We were a little bit disappointed because Jacob had positioned himself as the intentional maximalist, and we didn't really get that intentional maximalism in the realm of this funky electronic sound design weirdness. Eh. Volume 3 was still a pretty good record. Uh, but then, we didn't get Volume 4. Then we waited. Then we waited for a long time. People have always criticized Jacob. It's funny because there's kind of one central criticism of Jacob that comes up most of the time. It's really funny to me and I think to most old Jacob fans because it's less true now than ever before. And we'll get to that eventually. The word I keep coming back to uh, for Jesse 4 is disappointment. We can talk about why Jesse Volume 4 was bad and you know, we, we can we can know in the back of our minds or whatever that like, oh, ultimately music is subjective, but we're talking about some sort of value system and it's convenient to linguistically format it this way. But I actually think that talking about it being bad will make us miss some interesting points. I wanna talk about it being disappointing because that is the actual result. That is like the fact, is that I was disappointed by volume four and that many old fans of Jacob were disappointed by volume four. I think a lot of people coming from the outside because volume four has all this new visibility, Jacob's gotten way more popular, especially since volume three, people coming from the outside, they're not disappointed by it. A lot of them just don't like it, but I'm disappointed by it and I wanna talk about that. I actually like a lot of stuff on volume four. In fact, I would say a slight majority of the tracks on the album. This isn't true of all of my old Jacob fan friends, but at least for me, you know, I like a lot of it. And so to say that I'm disappointed by it, even though I like most of the tracks, it's kind of kind of interesting. That really makes you think about like, well, what is actually going on here? Why am I so disappointed by it? And the obvious answer is like, well, it's Jacob Collier. Like he's supposed to be a musical wizard. And so for him to come out with an album where so many tracks miss, beyond even categorically liking, I really like a lot of the tracks. Then there's a bunch of other tracks that I will voluntarily listen to for sure, that they're tracks that I like. For me, I think that includes some that are rather controversial. Uh, for me personally, I like well, and seemingly I'm the only one who does because people from outside don't like well, and then also like most of my friends who were fans of Jacob before Jesse hate well as well, and I don't know, maybe I just haven't been in enough guitar land to know how cliche certain things are or something like that, but oh well, lucky me. 100,000 voices. A microcosm of the album as a whole, cool central guitar riff, the gent section on its own is cool, but as we'll see with other tracks, putting things next to each other that are different sound worlds is not the same thing as effectively combining them. So I was thinking about doing a tier list or maybe just ranking them or maybe doing scores out of 10 or something like that, but I thought this would be more interesting. So basically you've got disappointment on the x-axis and interest on the y-axis, and that's musical interest, not high level interest. So not like how interesting would it be to talk about in this video, for instance, but more like how interesting is it to listen to. Uh, and that's important because later we'll talk about a track that's very interesting at a high level because it's so uninteresting at a musical level. So I just thought this would be more fun than uh, a standard ranking system. She put sunshine. Jacob Collier makes the best Owl City song I've ever heard. A lot of little nitpicks, but it's fine. Little Blue. A beautiful combination of volumes two and three. The chords could have been more interesting at some times and the lyrics are a bit cheesy, but that's not new in volume four and it's not enough that I mind. Well... As I said, I like this one. I, I don't know, man. I've heard a lot of comps for Well, but none of them really fill the same niche. This isn't the most Jacobian track ever, but no one else would do it quite like that. Cinnamon Crush. Texture, grooves, chords, performances. The lyrics are a little cringe at times, but the sound is so good that I don't care. 
wherever I go. If this was a Lawrence song, I would go, oh, that's kind of cool. They put some cool chords in their pop soul. But instead, I'm thinking, what a waste of Jacob Collier. In an absolute sense, it's fine, but a big disappointment from Jacob. Summer Rain. Similar to Little Blue, except this was Volume 1 with Volume 2, and similar thoughts as well. There could have been more interesting harmony throughout, but there are a lot of great moments and passages, and there is that one moment that melts me. A rock somewhere. A combination of volumes one and three this time, the intro makes you think it's gonna be sick, and then instead you get a cheesy melody and little to no apparent cross-pollination of musical languages. We go back and forth between uninspired Carnatic Fusion and 2016 Chainsmokers with worse vocal production. Again, putting two different sound worlds next to each other is not inherently interesting. The two features have little moments where they get to shred. Anushka Shankar and Varajashri Venugopal are sick, and I wish that I had gotten a lot more shredding from them because those parts are cool, but they don't make up for the rest of the track. Mikorazon. Rubbing in our face the long con of Jesse Volume 3, Mikorazon is kind of fun, but it's definitely not what I was hoping for from Jacob Collier. Witness me. We'll get to this one later. Never gonna be alone. The first track released from Volume 4, almost two years before the album came out. I find it really compelling. I think it totally succeeds at its goal of being a pretty, melancholy, catchy song. Bridge Over Troubled Water. The fifth installment in the subtextual giant acapella arrangement series. It is probably the least of the five, but that is a series of absolute titans. Bridge Over Troubled Water is potentially the best track on this album. This is the intentional maximalism that we wanted. It is one thing, it's not switching genres every 30 seconds, but we have some awesome harmony and some of the best, most incredible lead vocal performances ever put to record. Over you. Once again, we find a lot of different things that don't seem to have been very thoughtfully combined. There are some cool parts, and then Chris Martin comes in and it's just like, no, no, disjointed in general, cringe at times. Box of Stars Part 1. The TikTokification of Jesse. Basically, seven good songs that have been strung together into one big mess, another volume one and three hybrid that disappoints. The concept of the song is kind of cool, the knocking sound effect is kind of cool in concept, but in practice it's anxiety inducing. I will admit though, that get up on your feet refrain, that's good shit. Box of Stars Part 2. The Captain America Civil War of Jesse. There's a lot going on, and if you haven't been here since the beginning of the cinematic universe, you probably are going to be lost, and it's not going to make sense, and it's not going to sound good. But if you have been here for the previous 12 movies, or 51 tracks, it's great. It's a thoughtful combination of actual passages, melodies, lyrics, and straight up sections of other Jesse tracks. It's kind of like clarity, but for all of Jesse. The climax of this piece is one of my favorite moments on the whole album. World of World. Breathtaking, mature writing, amazing harmony and arrangement. The performance by the Aeolians was incredible. And this was a really cool way to end the Jesse project as a whole with a track that just like Home Is, the first track of Jesse Volume 1, is a choral arrangement where Jacob doesn't actually produce any of the sound himself. Okay, that was a lot. Now Wild, wild sea. The melody is not as strong as 100,000 Voices, but it's still pretty good. The mix has some rough spots, and there are some parts that are very cheesy on multiple levels, but I think this is the best of the Volume 1 and 3 hybrids. Magic. Solid, interesting, doesn't try to be too many different things, but is still very maximalist. It's a very overt sequel to Time Alone With You, and it's almost as good. All around you. There are parts I like a lot, but then there are other parts that do feel very purposeless and random. This is a true combination of one, two, and three, and at times that works well. Bridge over troubled water line. I wish there was less audience noise, but I have to admit it does give me chills. I'm a sucker for that diverging motion from the harmonizer, and Tori Kelly somehow does even more than on the studio version. Stars, voice memo. Not in fact a voice memo. <laughs> He layered other stuff on there. It's a pretty good song, but I wish he had either committed to producing it properly or making it an actual voice memo. <laughs> to clarify, just because I don't know if this will be misconstrued, uh, none of what I said there should be taken as a statement about the morality of 
the actions of the people who made these songs. Like, I'm sure Lawrence and Jacob Collier had a great time making that song together, and lots of people like Wherever I Go. It's actually a kind of fun song. Again, if I had discovered it through Lawrence, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But because it's a Jacob Collier track, I have expectations, and I'm also looking for music that's going to really connect with me. And, you know, I don't listen to Lawrence in general, so I'd be like, oh, that's a cool Lawrence track. But I'm not really looking for Lawrence tracks. And so when Jacob Collier collabs with them, it's like, oh, well, never mind. Okay, what went wrong with volume four? I have a few ideas. So one explanation for this is that basically Jacob tried to do too much. Not in the usual sense of trying to musically do too much. Like that's his thing is maximalism. Not in that sense, but more in the sense of actually beyond that, trying to do that and also make the record a pop record at the same time. You can't go and combine these three sound worlds that are already diverse in their own rights and also make something that's like massively appealing. I think another big problem with this record was the features. In general, it kind of seemed like the features were kind of random. Like, why is Jacob Collier collaborating with Chris Martin? or Sean Mendez. Those collaborators just didn't really make that much sense. What were they going to give Jacob? Compare this to volume two, where he had collaborators that nobody even heard of. Like I discovered a lot of people through volume one and two, his collaborations, where those collaborations made sense. Those were people who were bringing something to the table that Jacob didn't have. Leon Lajavas, Laura Mvula, you had Chris Thiele, you had Becca Stevens, Catherine Tickle. Like, you know, these are people who like are not super famous, but they brought something to those records that Jacob couldn't bring himself. I think the features on this kind of seemed more opportunistic, and I can't say exactly why Jacob collaborated with the people that he did. I don't know what happened behind the scenes there, but after the fact, looking back at it, it's like, eh, it looks like you were just kind of collaborating with a bunch of famous people. Then there's also the explanation of there's just a failure to deliver on that unbridled harmony and rhythm. People who became fans of Jacob between 3 and 4 may not be coming from this same kind of perspective, but for older Jacob fans from pre-Jesse, you know, it was all about that intentional maximalism, that unbridled harmony and rhythm, and we didn't get as much of that. So this is the thing, this is what I said I was going to come back to, right? This criticism that has always followed Jacob around is that he's too high on music theory. And all the music theory in the world cannot make up for a lack of emotional depth and conviction. And the thing is, people are saying this, especially outsiders who are not part of the Jacob Collier fandom, who haven't been fans of Jacob, but it's hilarious because that's exactly what's missing from this album. Like, he's not doing nearly as many cool chords, he's not doing as much cool arrangement. He's not being nearly as daring. He's kind of being more scattered maybe, but he's not doing a lot of that stuff anymore. And if he did more, this album would be better, at least for us, for the old Jacob fans. I think there is actually kind of a way in which it wraps around to being correct, if you want <laughs> to say that he's, he's doing too much music theory, uh, where it's like, actually there's more now than before. Because if you think about the rules and restrictions kind of misappropriation of music theory, in that sense, you could argue he's using more music theory. Uh, you know, the reason why he got his reputation that way is because he was like pushing the boundaries and demanding new music theory and making new music theory. Um, but on this album, you know, he isn't doing nearly as much of that. So <laughs> you could kind of say in that sense, there is more music theory on volume four. But okay, so he's not doing as much interesting music stuff, you know, in terms of harmony and rhythm. He's not pushing the boundaries of music theory as much, but why? Why not? I think it's tempting to blame the pop collaboration. Like the these pop musicians were like holding Jacob back. And I think there's some credence to this. Like I know Sean Mendez and Jacob Collier, they initially kind of bonded over shared ideology around like music's ability to bring people together. And they, they connected on that. And I met Sean very, very far from where I met Stormzy in uh, Malibu, California. And we threw a bunch of paint and, and thought very carefully about music and, and the power it has to bring people together. And then they went and made a song together, right? That's very different from, say, uh, Take Six. Jacob grew up with Take Six, Jacob was inspired by their music, and they connected over that. So maybe there's something to that. Uh, but I don't think this does very well at explaining, for instance, A Rock Somewhere. I think there is more to it. The world's crazy place. And actually, as an artist, if I do what I feel is my duty, which is to explain accurately how I see the world, how I experience the world, 
it's gonna sound like a mess sometimes. One idea is that with volume four, one of his goals was kind of to paint a very holistic picture of life and the world in general. There are beautiful parts, there are ugly parts, there's parts that people like and don't like, there's anger, there's beauty, and no one agrees on what's what. I personally don't really care for that kind of thing <laughs> in the form of an album in that way. If that's what Jacob wanted to do, I do think he did a decent job at that. Uh, but it's just... It's just not what, uh, not what I wanted. Another component of this may be his kind of long-held desire to subvert expectations. One very concrete example would be in soccer, um, or we'd say football. Um, if you take a penalty, if you look left and shoot left, right, base level one, like no bluffs. If you look left and shoot right, then I'm bluffing, right? So I've, I've displaced the expectation by one level. If he thinks I'm gonna bluff, I'm gonna double bluff and I'm gonna shoot left, which is the same as level one. So you're now, you're now on level you're on, you're on level three or something, you know, yeah. double bluff. I've always loved to outgrow myself. I've loved to outgrow my own expectations. Now typically what we've known him for doing this with is harmony and rhythm and even arrangement, but maybe he wanted to take that up a level and make the whole album a kind of subversion of expectations. Uh, he did say himself that volume four is one of the least genre albums ever and I can probably agree with that. And so if that's what he's trying to do to kind of subvert expectations on a higher level, maybe that's something. But I don't think that either of these explanations really do that great of a job. I made a lot of my first work for me. So that's not novel to me. That what's novel, what was novel to me at age 20 was to make something for others and with others. That felt new and interesting and inspiring. My trajectory of creativity has gone away from making things for me and towards making things for others. And I love it. The audience choir, like this idea that when I perform live, I, I can stand on stage and, and conduct the whole venue of audience members in three or sometimes six part harmony by um, giving them each a starting note, delegating zones by, by, by gestures, and then moving my fingers and hands up and down to kind of guide their direction without sort of saying a word about the process, just sort of, um, trusting the, the in, you know, intuition of, of the room and the sound of it and the sight of it and the feeling of it like completely changed my trajectory of of life almost. I mean, it sounds like a massive thing to say, but it really seriously made me rethink what music is for, what I'm for, um, how how my particular perspectives and gifts can can help people the most. Um, and I think there's something amazing about the idea of you know giving power to other people's voices over your own. This is my voice. It's, it's the voice of others. It's when I can offer whatever courage I have to you to use your voice. That's, that's me. That's me speaking. That's, that's me singing, you know? And so now I feel like I'm playing the whole world as a musical instrument. <laughs> and that feels so amazing. And that's what the album is about for me. So he is explicitly interested in making music for others. And to be fair, that comes from even the In My Room days. But more recently, right, this this feeling like the world is his instrument, the world is his voice, maybe that's making him feel like he wants to reach out to more people, he wants to reach more people. But I think that that desire to go outward may have had a kind of mutually reinforcing relationship with the pop collaborations. Quick note from the editor here, uh, there are two prongs to this. I wanna make this clear. One part of it is kind of like I just said, he wants to do pop because he wants to reach more people and therefore he's gonna work with pop musicians and that kind of goes back and forth. But there's also that he is going to relinquish control or he's going to not enforce his creative vision as much when he's doing these collaborations because he feels like his voice is the voice of others. So he's going to try to um, do his best to uplift whoever he's collaborating with as opposed to centering his own voice. And that's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But it stands to reason that if we discovered him for the stuff where he was in complete control, uh, then when he has less control and when he is relinquishing control, we aren't going to like it as much. Uh, so that there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, well, of course we don't like it because uh, whatever mechanics were at play when he was in full control, that's what we fell in love with. With Volumes 1 and 2, you know, because how, how do we explain that then? Volumes 1 and 2, those collaborators, for one, uh, were probably closer in line with the visions that Jacob was having um, by himself. And two, I think that this kind of philosophy of like my voice is actually the voice of others, I don't think that 
and the desire to collaborate were quite the same thing or even happened at quite the same time. It sounds like the my voice is the voice of others thing started later, like after volume two was already done. So that kind of explains what's going on decently well, I think. So Jacob has been touring for a long time. He's been he's been doing, you know, one man shows long ago and then he kind of graduated to having a band during Jesse and then that band kind of switched post volume 3 times and between volume 3 and volume 4 he toured a lot. It seems like now to some extent he feels like, you know, the real music is live. The real music is the tour and the record is kind of a backseat. Like, this album was meant to be played live. Oh, my album, I want the record to feel like this. I want the album to feel like I'm on stage conducting an audience. I can kind of respect that, right? I can kind of feel that actually, because, you know, I love going and playing music live. It's one of the best experiences and making records is also super fun, but I can kind of appreciate the perspective that like, yeah, the real music is live. However, <laughs> For most of us that listen to Jacob Collier, oh, we don't get to see him live very often, right? He has to go on a world tour and then we get to see him maybe every couple of years. <laughs> and so for most of us, it's like, well, Jacob Collier's music is the records, it's the content. But in his own words, like 100,000 Voices in particular, was like meant to be played live and the record is kind of a shadow of that and there's actually another track that exemplifies this i think even more than a hundred thousand voices so let's talk about witness me if you're gonna have corny lyrics then you at least need a sweet groove and if you're not gonna have a sweet groove then you need a good melody and if you're not gonna have a good melody then you at least need some interesting chords and if you're not gonna have interesting chords then you need some cool sound design or I guess you could have none of that. I've had the pleasure of hearing the instrumental to Witness Me, and it is literally a workplace safety training video type beat. It's excessively inoffensive, and that is precisely why it is so offensive in this context. Witness Me is, to its core, a commitment to the mundane and vapid, overflowing with distilled cringe. Because it takes itself super seriously, right, as this pop gospel record with a really important message about being there for one another or something like that, but it's got nothing to it. And failure to deliver while taking yourself super seriously is the essence of cringeworthiness. Kirk Franklin's choir is easily the best part of this, but it's a bit like an A-lister in a student film. It, it just simply is not coming close close to making up for everything else. Uh, Stormzy's part is also fine by me. It happens to include the one cool chord progression in the track, uh, and it is lyrically stronger than the rest of the track, I guess. But there's a live version that's actually pretty good. It has a breakdown section, which is my favorite part, and not on the record at all. <laughs> I've seen it on the Volume 4 tour, actually, and he also did it on Jimmy Kimmel with Tori Kelly and Christian Newman on drums. But on the record, we get Shawn Mendes and mind-numbingly uninspiring MIDI drums. There is one decently cool chord progression in the track, and it has a couple of good voicings, like I said towards the end of Stormzy's verse, and that's it. That is the only morsel of musical interest in the track, and it is unbelievable that I'm saying that about a Jacob Collier record. Witness Me also doesn't really have any grounding in Jesse. This is kind of unique to Witness Me. Like, the other tracks from Volume 4 that I don't like very much, like A Rock Somewhere or Box of Stars Part 1, they at least have a clear kind of relationship with Jesse. Right, they have this part from volume one, this part from volume three, this part from volume two, that kind of thing. But Witness Me is kind of singular, like it's so bland, it doesn't draw from anything in particular. I almost want to believe in like a Witness Me conspiracy. <laughs> like, what if there was some like contract bureaucratic shenanigans going on that limited what could be on the track? Obviously that's absurd, but it's just hard to believe that Jacob would be okay with this, especially the drums. Like with Shawn Mendes, admittedly, I just don't really like how his voice sounds, so that's kind of on me. But the drums, why not have an actual gospel drummer? Genuinely, what could possibly be bad about having a real gospel drummer drum on this track? I was kind of shocked by Witness Me because unlike other volume four tracks that I didn't like, that we're doing too much. Like A Rock Somewhere is a great example. A Rock Somewhere is, is trying to be pop and also carnatic fusion and also a third thing. And all at the same time, I feel like that is contradictory and it doesn't work for me, but at least it's trying to be something interesting. At least Jacob is doing something that <laughs> hasn't really been done before. And so I respect that to some extent. 
But with Witness Me, it's trying to be one thing and still failing. And it was genuinely, on an absolute scale, a negative experience which I didn't think was possible for a Jacob Collier track. Now hearing all these scathing remarks, which are admittedly overly dramatic to some extent, you might think that it sounds bad to me. And some of my friends would definitely say that Witness Me sounds bad. But I wouldn't say that, not exactly. Witness Me doesn't sound bad, Witness Me sounds empty. It sounds safe, so safe, as to wholly depart from everything that I value in my all-time favorite musician's music. And in that way, it is perhaps the most disappointing record that I've ever heard. So maybe Jacob tried too much, maybe his collaborators were a bit random, this album was meant to be played live, and then there were just some failures on individual tracks that really took it down. Okay. But, um, was this even possible? Was there any world where Volume 4 actually would have satisfied me? When the deluxe tracks came out, Wild Wild Sea in particular really got me thinking about this, because Wild Wild Sea is very much what Jacob said Volume 4 was going to be. For me, and for a lot of young jazz musicians who were fans of Jacob before Jesse, you know, we were teenagers during the In My Room era, and now we're adults or at least we've grown up a lot. You know, when I was falling in love with Jacob's music the first time, that coincided with me kind of crystallizing my identity as a person. And I don't think that this kind of formativism argument nearly accounts for the disappointment of Volume 4, but it might be sufficient to make it categorically disappointing. I think the weight also had a lot to do with it. Uh, waiting that long and being strung along by Jacob, you know, because this wasn't like Kendrick where he just disappeared for five years and then dropped another double album that was actually pretty good. Uh, Jacob strung us along. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying that he was being malicious, I'm not saying that this is his fault even, but, like, we were strung along. He kept saying, oh, volume four soon, volume four soon, in various different ways, and that went on for years. And I think that definitely kind of left a bitter taste in our mouths and made the food taste worse when we finally got it. So, Volume 4. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments. Um, I do think it's important to remember that Jacob Collier is just a guy. He's just a, he's just a person. And um, I don't think the old Jacob is coming back. So, you know, if we really want that again, we probably need to go make that ourselves probably need to do that stuff. And uh, speaking of that, actually, uh, I do have an album coming out soon. It might already be out by the time you're seeing this, but I know for sure there's at least one single out, and that features Israel Strom, who rips an incredible solo on it. It's really good. So uh, you should go check that out if you want to know what's behind this guy. Who the fuck does he think he is? Does he even make music? Is his music even good? Well, you can answer that for yourself should be there in the description. Anyway, I think we'll probably talk more about this maybe on a live stream or something. Um, get into some reviews, some review, some meta reviews, I guess. Sure, review reviews. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. Till next time. We'll pull out all this toss for this one. Um, Witness Me is, to its core, a squeaky clean commitment to the mundane and to the vapid, and overflowing from its foundation is distilled cringe. Yeah, that, <laughs> I don't think that one. <laughs>